So don't talk of the cutscene, please. But I haven't. Oh, <laughs> they don't waste any time, huh? Just like the last time, our alter ego seems somewhat melancholy when not engaged in a brand new Ultima adventure. You have traded the Avatar's life of peril and adventure for the lonely serenity of a world at peace. But television Superman cannot take the place of friends who died at your side. His cravings are so severe that when he notices something as inconspicuous as a lightning strike, his first thought is, is this a sign from distant Britannia? Then again, this guy seems to have a peculiar mind. Like seriously, I can't just ignore this. What the hell is with this poster on the wall? And why? Out of all the ultimate experiences he had, he chose to frame the most traumatic one. As if you are in any position to judge someone's choice of framed artwork. I guess not. In addition to some rather cool VGA visuals and quite a moving score, this opening conveys so much information about the character in just a 30 second time frame. Specifically, how he finds his real life shallow in comparison to a virtual one. And I mean, you can sort of see it, don't you? Two titles prior, In Search of Entertainment, he unknowingly stumbled upon a life changing experience that brought a sense of meaning and purpose in his life. Don't forget that the story of that game was philosophical in nature. The Avatar didn't receive his title for no reason. Real life suddenly, as we've learned in the following game, became shallow and dull in his altered perception. And not because of escapism, mind you. Considering what merely playing through Ultima 5 does to you, I'd have to imagine that actually living through it must have been quite traumatic. He seems to be rather well off in his apartment, so it's safe to assume that a dystopia that highlights some of the worst aspects of reality is not something he might want to escape to, necessarily. The reason he craves that experience is because it just feels more fulfilling, meaningful and truthful than his everyday life. Each time he finds himself back in the real world, he just can't find that meaning there. Which is something I find uh, is somewhat relatable. That is not the right takeaway from this. How so? The character is obviously exhibiting signs of mental illness or trauma. He doesn't seem to have any social life with escapism being his only joy, through which he sublimates meaningful life. Didn't realize you moonlight as a therapist, Seal. You don't have to be one to see that there is something wrong with him, George. Well, uh, anyway. After stepping through a suspicious looking portal and being rescued by our friends Dupre, Yolo and Shamino, we are thrown right into the heat of battle. I wish I had some time to adjust, thank you very much. I guess this should work. <laughs> Would you look at that? A DOS game with a somewhat intuitive UI. Didn't think I'd see something more surreal today than a leather-bound zebra centaur with a bad attitude. You are not going to let it go, are you? I mean, look at it! What even is this? Why would you frame something this bizarre? But alright, after the battle's over, we now have to... And I want you to admire the friendly welcome we receive here, prove to Lord British whom we've just saved from gargoyles, mind you, that we are who we appear to be, with a classic copy protection quiz. Of course, only a guy with a poster of an equine pop star would know what part of the tangle wine does put one to sleep. Ah, it is indeed thee, Georg. Take this key. Britannia is under attack by gargoyles such as those who just fought. 
Thus far they have mainly been attacking the shrines of the eight virtues. Notice that the keywords are now highlighted to make their identification easier, altering the dialogue experience from the puzzle solving of Ultima 4 to a more leisurely style of later RPGs. I'm somewhat sorry to admit, but the moment I saw a word highlighted like that, there was an almost audible click in my head, as the Morwin dialogues suddenly made a lot more sense. It always baffled me how its conversations were structured like Wikipedia articles. So having experienced the evolution of dialogues from one Ultima to the next, I can now see where Bethesda was drawing inspiration. The underscoring isn't the only thing that's changed about those dialogues. Look at what happens when we leave the castle. A peasant runs up to us, initiates a dialogue. <clears throat> and starts waxing our ears off with positively insane claims, such as the ones that he is the very same Lord British we've just had a conversation with. This encounter may not look like much today, compared to games like Baldur's Gate and Planescape, but, and I want to be clear on that, coming from Ultima 4 and 5, this encounter was so bizarre that I honestly didn't know whether to believe him or not. You see, as good as Ultima 4's dialogues have been, they were vessels to convey themes and gameplay hints. Ultima 5 was a lot more story driven, but the NPCs were basically just there to deliver world building exposition. The NPCs served a function in those games. Even if they were to lie, there would usually be a clear reason for it, serving as some kind of a hint or other. So, when you stumble upon this guy that blatantly lies to you for absolutely no gameplay reason, it becomes emblematic of a shift in the purpose of dialogues. Believe it or not, the primary focus of this and all conversations in this game is to be entertaining. Even your party members chime in with their own two cents every once in a while, like in the Dragon Age and the like. That is, to my mind, one of the greatest contributions of Six to the series, the decision to prioritize the character of those characters, or their utilitarian function as NPCs. Just look at this dialogue with the sleepy looking Nema, for instance. It's completely unnecessary. She doesn't give you any vital hints or items. In fact, you can easily miss her entirely on your playthrough, but there is just so much charm in that little interaction. How, if you keep talking about her favorite topic, dreams, she eventually becomes so sleepy as to just doze off in the middle of the conversation. In the middle of the street. I've forgotten most dialogues from 4 about a month after beating it, but I bet I'll remember moments like this when thinking back to this game. There is a gypsy fortune teller named Pandora, to simply visit whom you have to make a conscious effort, and who solicits cash donations in between every other word of her reading. So much so that I've started to suspect foul play. But hers turns out to be the only accurate one in the game. Her shady character is further shaded when another quest brings you to her for questioning and her evasive answers do shine a light on that mysterious house for sale, with blood covering the bedsheets. Not every NPC is a unique character full of entertaining dialogues like this, obviously but about 98% of them are, which is something not even Fallout's can claim. What do you mean? Of course Fallout has more text dedicated to conversations. I mean percentage-wise. Uh, there was a lot of NPCs in that game that didn't have a dialogue tree programmed onto them, but in 6, every single NPC has one. I see. Some of them are rather bare bones, though. 
One of my favorites is in the tavern from the village of Paws, with its kitchen positively crammed with cats, which doesn't seem alarming to its proprietor, the charismatic Dr. Cat, whose energetic, playful demeanor reads nothing like the shy, introverted lines of Nema or the somewhat threatening entitlement of Pandora. He even engages you in a counting game. The same one this guy from Strange Journey plays with you. Except Dr. Cat isn't as simple a fella here. He plays a couple rounds with you normally, letting you win some low betting games. But then he says, tell you what, I'm in a reckless mood. This time you can bet as much as you like. So naturally, like a proper fool, I naively bet all my savings, thinking that I got this guy covered only for him to use an unbeatable strategy against me, essentially hustling me out of all my money. I've noticed an alarming trend in your interactions with people. Explains a lot, to be honest. Oh, don't give me that. I have already explained all this. It took me a while to start treating those NPCs as, well, actual characters. Right, totally. Especially that part when you didn't save before gambling. I just forgot. Happens to everybody. Sure. And how are you going to get your money back now? Well, as it happens, Dr. Cat mentions a book he'd like to get his hands on. If I bring it to him, I get a whole 300 crowns. Same amount I lost, coincidentally. This is another notable contribution of Ultima 6. There is a number of those optional quests, like the cook Shubin that asks for dragon eggs to complete his magician's pastry. Or how about discovering the secret of the wisps, which, for reasons unbeknownst to me, makes me think of Star Control 2. The reward for which is not only the ability to learn the 8th level spells, but also the Armageddon spell, which is said to destroy all life forms in the current realm. I get the feeling I probably shouldn't use it. Glad to see your naivety has a line, at least. I'll pretend I haven't heard it. So, optional side quests are my favorite thing about the whole genre, so I'm obviously quite thrilled to see a game that started it all. I won't pretend I haven't heard it. Sorry to break it to you, but Pool of Radiance, for example, had side quests two years before Ultima 6. Oh, um, let's pretend to... whatever. But, um, I don't have this book right now, and I do need money. Getting here I had taken note of some of the shops that sell items of no particular value to an adventurer like wool, thread, grain, cloth, etc., indicating a trading mechanic, akin to Sid Meier's Pirates or Space Rangers. You can buy cloth for 15 crowns from a sewer and sell it for 20 to a tailor, for instance. Now, if you expect something as elaborate as Star Sector or X3, you'll be sorely disappointed. It's more basic than even the trading from Mount and Blade. Let me illustrate. You can buy flour in Paws for 4 crowns and sell it for 6 in Britain. Those prices are fixed and never change, which is part of the problem. This results in a short travel and the profit of 2 per rather weighty unit, so you won't be able to carry enough to make a meaningful amount. It's safe to assume that the longer the route, the greater the profit, so let's say buy wool, which is even heavier than feathers, sorry, flour, for 5 per unit at Magincia, and then sail it all the way to pause. Want to know what massive wages we shall gather? A profit of entirely 1 crown per unit. Just for perspective. I can get up to 150 crowns from killing a single low-level troll. 
As it turns out, the greatest profit can be gained from the very trade I had described first. Reselling cloth with a profit of 5 per a very light unit. Filling your entire crew can earn you up to 180 gold per party member. Surely such great profit would warrant a long route. Like going from Moonglow all the way to you. Not exactly. Well, it must be at least longer than the one dollar route, right? No, it's shorter. Scarabriah to Trinzic. Minak to Britain? You'd think that I'm dragging this segment out too much. Just, just say that it's Britain to pause and be done with it, George. Oh no, my friends. It's shorter than that. A lot shorter. In fact, let me just show you this route in its entirety. You buy cloth, walk across the street and sell it for the greatest profit in this entire game. I'm not asking for a dynamic economy system here, just why not make it so that those items would be more expensive but require you to travel from town to town? The amount of time you'd spend would be the same, but at least it would be more engaging. But anyway, I've made 1080 gold in 20 minutes, which is enough to buy three of the most expensive armor sets and enough food to not think about it ever again. So yeah, the economy system of six is rather all over the place. But trading is not why we are here. The dialogues, as we've established, are absolutely wonderful, full of charm and personality. And the same can be said about the quests. You might recall my disappointment at the somewhat lessened town solving of 5 compared to the 4th Ultima. So I am happy to say that it comes back in full swing this time. Every town has a rune and mantra for you to find, and each of them is framed around a unique quest. In New Magincia, to find the rune, you have to identify the humblest person in town. That humble competition is rather easy to figure out, for those hermits and farmers are positively trumping my expectations when it comes to humility. Or how about Jellum? The rune served as a trophy in the Valor competition and has been awarded to no man. Speaking to no man, you discover that the rune was lost at a pub. Stolen, in fact, by a rat. This narrative is later confirmed by the people working there, who seem to be somewhat terrified of the rat in question. All attempts to confront the rat bring no results, for I can't seem to squeeze inside of his abode. So what do we do? We recruit the help of Sherry. The single most adorable little mouse I've ever seen. She literally becomes a party member, maintaining the proper squad formation, as well as keeping watch during camping and stuff. Adorable! And now, in a breath of fire fashion, we unlock a previously blocked off area with her abilities. While Ultima 4 had a very puzzle-oriented town solving, 6 is more about dialogues and characters. It's safe to say that the more recent RPGs followed the example of the latter rather than the former. Just look at Scarabry. As you enter the town, you are greeted by the mayor. He tells you that the rune was in possession of a recent murder victim, Quinton, who took the knowledge of its location to the grave. Gideon was the one tending the corpse and he comments that there was an amulet clutched in the dead man's hand. Gideon gave the amulet to Yorl, who was the closest friend of the deceased. Yorl then tells you that he gave the amulet to the daughter of the murdered. So, finally, talking to the girl and asking about the amulet, you receive a clue that reveals the location of the rune. 
That's a nice little murder mystery here, isn't it? Add to that all the various witnesses with conflicting accounts, the ambiguity of Quinton's past, the rumor of a ghost visiting the inn's backyard, and don't forget that this entire quest is explored through those wonderfully written, character-driven dialogues, and you get a very engaging Fallout-esque experience. If there is one thing that defines Fallout's quests, it's multiple solutions. I don't see that here. Well, maybe not to the same extent, but this game isn't as rigid as you might think. Let's say there is an item you need from an NPC, who sends you on an errand or demands something in return. You can just kill the NPC and take the item. Or, at least, steal it with a pickpocket spell. Sure, it would damage your karma, but this game is rather lenient with its punishments. You can easily kill and steal a couple times before the shrines stop talking to you. Which is how you level up, by the way. And also, how should I put this? You can cheese a lot of those quests. Remember that fun little Jellum adventure? Following the mayor's clue about the rune by talking to no man who lost it to a rat. But when you go to the pub, you are told all that and more in a singular conversation that doesn't require any clues to initiate. So, if you just happen to go there first, you make this quest less interesting. It's this accursed luck factor again. Wouldn't it be better? If the girl only told you about the rat in a hole, maybe about Sherry as well, while leaving everything about the rune to the mayor and no man. As it is, this dialogue makes this whole errand completely pointless. Why make this entire network of references in Scarabriah when during the dialogue with the aforementioned daughter, the first thing you see highlighted is her amulet. Asking about which gives away the rune location. In other words, this entire detective quest is rendered completely unnecessary with this tiny little misstep. It spoils the quest. And what's weird is that it could be fixed with the most minor of tweaks. Just remove the line about the amulet and there you go, you have an excellent quest on your hand. And, uh... Unfortunately, those are not isolated incidents. There is a lot of quality quests here that get ruined with such annoyingly small and avoidable mistakes. The biggest example is the Sid Meier's treasure map quest, which substitutes about 30% of the whole game. A key plot item due to an unfortunate series of events ended up in a pirate's buried treasure. The map to which, as you learn from Homer over here, is split into nine parts. What follows is a series of subquests in the wane of the classic Gaza the Eight artifacts to save the Final Fantasy variety, with the twist being the organic way the search is woven into the gameplay. Jigsawing those hidden map pieces together to learn the item location has a vibe of authenticity that is somewhat refreshing. It's like if you knew the treasure location from, let's say, an FAQ, you could easily just disregard this entire main quest line and go straight for the tablet. It's like the Fallout's water chip. Exactly. There's something neat about games not blocking off plot items with artificial triggering mechanics, which force you to play the game in a linear fashion. Like, it would be so much less interesting if along with the final map piece you'd get a key to it or something. There is a certainty here that every artifact, character, dungeon and town are going to be right there from the very start of the game. They are not just magically appearing when the plot requires them. That said, 4 was exactly like that and it works so well because of how thoroughly thought out it was. 
It's rather hard to do an open world without any locked off areas or triggered plot events. And justifiably so, because the end result is a journey through a believable world that does not feel like it revolves around the player. If, let's say, at the start of the game, Lord British were to say that the coveted one pure axiom is that of which is something you are supposed to learn only after hours of progress, what would be the point of actually doing this quest then? Even though you'd probably do it just in case something else were to pop up after finishing it, the eventual realization that you got absolutely nothing new for completing it would sour and even ruin the whole process. Isn't it fascinating how just one word can turn 20 hours of brilliant gameplay into an utter slog? A single word. That is exactly what happens here. The Jellum Snowman puzzle is rendered pointless because a girl mentions a rune without any reason for it. The fun murder mystery of Scarabriah is ruined with the solitary underscore of a word. Unfortunately, there is a number of examples like this in 6, and one of them is the treasure map quest. If you remain unconvinced of how massive an impact a poorly chosen word might have had in Ultima 4, just wait until you hear how they've managed to screw the 30% of Six's gameplay with a single line. Remember Homer? You have to join the Thieves Guild before he tells you about this whole map business, which is not the problem here. What is, though, is that before you join the guild, he tells you of a shipwreck just southwest of your current location. Naturally, as any person playing a game that requires to pursue such clues, I went there, explored the shipwreck and found a so-called map piece with a cross on it. Now, I'm not a genius by any stretch of the imagination, so it would probably be safe to assume that it's not just me who could deduce that there is no place on this whole map where the cross could possibly go other than this island here. See the shape of the land and its correlation to the lines? What I'm saying is that this solitary map piece gives you sufficient information to find the treasure. Getting the eight remaining pieces, mind you, requires to explore numerous dungeons to completion sacrifice useful items and all of that for a bit of information you had from the very beginning. Okay, but how would you find the exact spot of the treasure without his directions? How indeed? Surely this totally inconspicuous patch of dirt in the middle of the swamp could not possibly be the lo <gasps> Look, I found it! Well, I have no answers then. I still think you are blowing this out of proportion. You yourself had fun with this quest. True, true. The appeal of this game, after all, is in the dialogues with those fun little characters you meet along the way. Even though I have completed the map to just humor the game, it is still something I very much enjoyed, because the journey itself was worth the price of admission. You see, while such a misstep would be absolutely fatal for the gameplay-focused Ultima 4, here it's not as severe, since this game aims for a much broader appeal than its predecessors. All of the three last Ultimas are considered the Age of Enlightenment trilogy, capturing the Golden Age of Britannia. But one might be forgiven for not really buying that. Five is one of the most depressing RPGs I've ever played, and four… well, the atmosphere wasn't its strongest part. 
Six, on the other hand, feels like a proper fantasy escapism. Those colorful graphics with exaggerated portraits and stylized UI have their charm. Those are not the greatest 2D visuals, obviously, but there is something so comfortable about them. Like, they are so definitively DOS. With the grass being represented by those alternating green and brown pixels, with those neatly arranged character sprites, those little icons for items, there is a charm to this aesthetic, surely. And the game seems to embrace this charming feel. Characters, even when they are what you'd call bad people, are rather cartoonish in the way they show it. Even the villains of this game, gargoyles, turn out to be just misunderstood. Which is a twist you'll probably see coming from the moment you start the game. It's obviously not as conceptually or atmospherically interesting as 5, but as far as the more light-hearted fantasy adventures go, it's not half bad. There are just so many little details abound. Like finding a castle filled with two-headed monsters, the Cyclops' abode where they take care of an orphan child, or an astronomer, who is probably a massive Discworld fan that tries to prove the Earth is flat, and turns out to be correct when you actually find the edge. Exploring 6 reminded me a lot of Gothic 2. There is a certain handcrafted feel to its rather small world that illustrates a preference for quality over quantity. You can walk from one end of the continent to another in about 10 minutes, but if you were to explore towns, solve quests and interact with people, you'll have dozens upon dozens of hours worth of engaging content on your hands. It's just a very pleasant game to be in. A friendly game that you can escape to and relax. Except for that whole child murdering thing. There he goes again. No, no, don't misunderstand. I'm just as baffled as you are. Hopefully. Here I'm making my way through a dungeon, built like a diabolical maze of ladders, tunnels and traps, only to discover a bloodied altar at the bottom, surrounded by people in robes and children. My takeaway from all this becomes obvious. I rush in to save the children, only to have them attack me with their tiny little fists. Continuing the Discworld references, they apparently wanted to be sacrificed. Maybe they are mind controlled. Didn't you think of that before defending yourself? It's not me, it's my party members. They were so trigger happy that I couldn't switch their autopilot fast enough. In any case, that idea goes out the window when you discover children in other dungeons, where there are no wizards or magic users. Children are just semi-regular enemies here. Remember how Gog made a statement that they shall not return kids to Fallout for the fear of them being at the mercy of the players? That now looks doubly insensitive on their part, since they seem to not respect the honorable and long-standing RPG tradition of child murder that's been around since Ultima 5. Oh boy. You know... It's weird just how much bad stuff you can do in this virtuous game about an honorable avatar. You can drink, hire a prostitute, literally murder everyone, including cats and dogs. Not to mention stealing and robbing people. Who could have guessed that there was a game in which you could murder a prostitute to get your money back 11 years before GTA 3. And that game was of the noble Ultima franchise. There is even an opportunity to go an extra mile in terms of being a dick. The Martitian, who eats dead bodies by the way, offers to burn the corpses of anyone you bring to him. 
so that they could never be resurrected again. There is a problematic social class issue he unknowingly points out. Those who cannot afford resurrection know the cold comfort of good honest soil. So yeah, as long as you've got money and goons in this realm, you can live forever and burn whoever is challenging your authority. The only thing you cannot do in this patriarchy, bizarrely enough, is use a ship you don't own. Now listen. Killing children is fine and dandy, but using a frigate without an appropriate deed? Are you some kind of a sick freak? Before you unleash Jack Thompson upon Lord Bridges' personal prostitute murder in Utopia, allow me to clarify the reason for adding all those things. This game allows and incentivizes immoral behavior. While 5 did so with gameplay difficulty and plot decisions that required sacrifices for the sake of a grander goal, here there is no need to be evil. It is the very presence of items that you can get your hands on. It is the ease with which you can achieve goals by lying, stealing and killing people that tempt you to act undignified and commit unnecessary sin. Note that it becomes impossible to win, level up in particular, if you act upon those sinful desires. You see, to beat this game you have to maintain virtues, to suppress all the urges that the game itself incentivizes, and instead act as this paladin-like avatar. In other words, you actually have to roleplay in this roleplaying game. It's really cool. 4 had something similar with the temptation to escape battles, but here it's far better implemented. It's not punishing you for behaving rightfully, but simply tests your resolve, makes you question your impulses. Also a couple acts of theory and innocent enough lies can be balanced out with the good you are committing, you just have to not overdo it. On the topic of advice, I highly recommend going through the sewer dungeon first. This is the Buccaneer's Cave. Nah man, it's the sewer dungeon. The way you unlock it is by blowing up the ironclad door to the Lord British's private bathroom, descending which you find a guy weirdly fascinated with ducks. He even gives you a rubber one. Fascinating. I mean, it is intended as the first dungeon. Partly because it's one of the few that doesn't require swamp boots. Seriously though, buy swamp boots as fast as humanly possible. But mainly because it opens up the treasure map quest. A bit weird how such an important dungeon is hidden so much out of sight. It's actually one of the reasons the questing in this game isn't as good as in 4, in which no matter how you go about its non-linear open world, you'll get the intended experience. In 6, on the other hand, if you either miss or decide to postpone the sewer dungeon until you beat all the other ones, you'll noticeably worsen your experience with the game. There should have been an NPC that either hinted at this dungeon or something like that. Another thing that can screw you over is the decision to postpone the liberation of the Compassion Shrine. Due to how hyped the gargoyles are, the player might logically decide the best course of action is to get stronger first, without realizing that you need this shrine to level up. And that is simply because there is no information given to you about that. It's something intended for you to find on your own. So, if a player is cautious, he is going to be severely punished. Going through a much more excruciating gameplay experience than the player that would decide to liberate the shrine and talk to it. I had to look it up, to be frank, because 
Why would you talk to the shrine instead of using it? I tried the use command. Got nothing. Assume that the shrines are just there for you to gather moonstones and so played a significant chunk of the game without leveling up. You see how it all just doesn't click as much as the progression of 4. There are those uh, beginner traps essentially, which you might or might not fall into on your first playthrough that determine the quality of your experience with the game. Do I even have to point out that it's not a good thing? And also, how on earth are you supposed to find dungeons here? They are not shown on the map, they are not revealed with the gems. The only way to identify them is via visual contact, with this ridiculously low visibility. Let's say someone hasn't played the previous games, and thus hasn't memorized all those dungeon locations by heart. What are they supposed to do? Even knowing that there is a dungeon, shrine and codex on the Isle of the Avatar, it took me 18 minutes to just understand where everything is there with the use of land revealing spells. 18 minutes that YOLO is not soon going to forget, having to carry a boat on his back the entire time. On a more positive note, unlocking shrines, regent and item vendors makes for a genuine routing experience that was lacking in 5. Although here it's a lot easier to get from place to place. There is no arena based random encounters anymore, thus there is not as much need to plan your routes as before. To make up for that there is now a wait mechanic, which adds a whole new dimension to management, as you now have to not only plan your routes, but also the distribution of items across your party. Another improvement is the interface. It's a lot quicker to aim with a mouse than by moving the target reticle around with buttons. Something I want to personally note is that gold here has weight, which is a mechanic I cherish whenever I find it in a game. It adds so much complexity to what would otherwise be trivial. It incentivizes spending your cash. Disincentivizes the player from abusing mechanics to get ridiculous amounts of gold they'll never use and it just heightens the pride of holding large sums in your inventory. Like just look at how much it weighs, a whole 20 stones of gold. That just makes me happy. Okay, okay, we get it, Scrooge McDuck. Can you move on please? All, all right, well, another neat addition that both you and I can appreciate still is the appearance of a proper area of effect fireball. And ah, uh, would you look at that. What a perfect opportunity for a demonstration of why. You know... There are some massive flaws with the magic here. Useless spells for a start. And I don't mean that in this spell is worse than the others kind of way, but it literally does nothing because they forgot to program it kind of way. What's even more idiotic is that there are literally no magic users as party members in the entire game. I was positively baffled with this discovery and personally take issue with making Janna, the druid, my favorite character who had the most interesting dialogue of all party members in 4 and had a beard in its sequel, has no magic abilities here and for no reason. You might argue that this is because the magic is OP as hell. The cheap disable spell, which you can learn very early on, has a 100% hit rate at reducing the target's HP to 1, making it the easiest Ultima game by far. And it's not the only way to break it. Glass swords are rather cheap and kill everything in one hit. 
the invisibility ring prevents enemies from retaliating even when you attack them. So, if the devs were trying to avoid making Janna OP, tough luck. Armed with glass swords and invisibility rings, she has cleared a layer of about 8 dragons on her own. Oh, and the great heal spell simply removes the threat of dying flat out. As you can tell, this game is not as well balanced as 5, which had a gradient of enemies in terms of difficulty. You couldn't kill dragons or demons offhand, but you could orcs and skeletons. Here, even without abusing the mechanics, it feels like the difficult end of the spectrum is lessened. It plays much more akin to the sinking ships with bare hands at level 1 experience of the first Ultima. And um, as a result, there is not much of this classic RPG satisfaction of getting stronger and stronger, eventually beating those previously impossible enemies. It's weird that only the fifth game in the series got this thing right. The dungeons here are a mixed bag. Remember how in 4 there were all those rooms, each presenting a unique gameplay situation? 6 doesn't really have that. You just explore the tunnels, killing everyone in your path, marking a return to the Ultima 3's approach to dungeon design, except a lot better realized. And from a different perspective, making them more difficult to map, for one thing. Since they all look absolutely identical, it starts to become a bit monotonous, if not for how each dungeon has a certain thing going on in terms of layout. Just compare the narrow, maze-like tunnels of the Ant Mond that are just as difficult to fight in as to navigate through to the giant open caverns of the Distart's Dragon Lair, which are just as easy to get lost in, but for a different reason. And compare them both to Shame that has those insanely long tunnels that only occasionally split up. It's very easy to map, but it gets a bit tiresome to backtrack after hitting a dead end. Isn't it fascinating how you can make visually identical dungeons? feel distinct through absolutely nothing but their layouts. It's not enough, though. In Wizard 7, in addition to mapping the dungeons, you had to manage your resources, strategically utilize the combat system, figure out the extensive puzzles. There were layers of mental stimulation, without which the gameplay becomes a mindless slog, which is Sadly, what we have here. I don't want to be overly negative, so let's look at the best dungeon here. The very pirate cave that the map was leading us to, as an example of how they all should have been. It starts slow, there are infrequent forks in the tunnels, with those fun misdirecting signs, one of which says certain deaths below expecting the player to take it for a reverse psychology trick and jumping, which we won't. Tunnels eventually open up into a symmetrical maze with entire six ways to get to the next level. The symmetry allows to easily understand where to go. Descending just one of the four ladders here leads to one of the four aisles in a lake. As soon as you see this, you no longer need to try the other ladders to know that they'll lead you to those other islands. Just so you know, in other dungeons you always have to check each ladder. The symmetrical layout also allows the game to reward the player who has not went down the aforementioned death below. Using the remaining two ladders, you appear by the sides of this giant death trap from a beneficial vantage point, clearing what would otherwise be a considerable problem. 
because of the symmetry, you can understand geometrically that using the hole would lead you there. Do you see how the developers have managed to create an interesting situation out of essentially thin air? Imagine if there was no hole no sign, no symmetry, and this room would just be another one you discover through exploration. There would be no decision making, no visceral reaction to making the wrong choice, nor any gratification for the correct one. Imagine a normal Ultima 6 dungeon, in other words. Sorry, back to positivity. Going down a level, we discover a maze with 10 holes all leading down. Because of the previous Death Below experience, you are now cautious about jumping. And yes, turns out that this wasn't just a gag, but a proper game design way of teaching you a new mechanic. So now you are inclined to map out the maze prior to making any leaps. Thus you discover a solitary ladder. Exploring the level below, you see numerous lava pits conspicuously coinciding to the locations of the holes above. Logical to assume that jumping down them would not have been the smartest idea. It's all basic stuff. Why are you mulling over it so much? Well, playing through those dungeons is a rather brainless activity. So, the fact that this one has managed to make us think environmentally and assess the situation to wake up, essentially, is a sign of proper game design. Plus, I haven't talked about the best part yet. What follows is an environmental puzzle where you have to compare the maps of the two levels and identify the one hole that doesn't lead to a lava pit. No one explains that to you. The reason you naturally come to this conclusion is because the game taught you the mechanics of this dungeon prior to throwing its ultimate challenge at you. If the player were to just suddenly find this puzzle in another dungeon without proper introductions, they would probably just try those holes one by one on pure mindless momentum of dungeon crawling, which is a sign of just how boring most dungeons are here. They all have those pointless dead ends, which you have to check each time have to since ladders aren't shown on the map. Even the pirate's cave is not perfect. Those stretches at the second level could and should have been cut, as they do nothing but distract you from the revelation of the death below. There is just so much fat in those dungeons that it drowns the interesting things that are in them. Like the too high a respawn rate of enemies that makes mapping more difficult than it is already. This game in particular makes me wish so much for an auto map feature from Shin Megami Tensei. Hell, even Wizard 7 had a map. I mean, why not have smaller dungeons, which would be easier to map, but if not have them all be thoughtfully designed, at least fill them with unique and challenging enemy encounters that would require thoughtful usage of magic, equipment and character placement. You are just describing the Ultima Force dungeons, but with a better combat engine. Exactly. In any case, those dungeons could be improved. But a lot is forgiven for letting me turn on the AI of party members. One of the most annoying things about previous games was the unnecessary micromanagement of every, even the most minute action of every character. So letting them go off on their own is… such a blessing. Like seriously, it speeds up the battles so much. And yeah, it is a bit weird to have the game play itself like that. But nothing's stopping you from taking the reins into your hands when the situation demands it. 99% of battles just 
don't warrant that amount of attention from you. So having an AI is... I simply can't stress enough how much I appreciate it here. I use the same person that has played the entirety of Dragon Age with the AI turned off. What happened to you? Hemorrhoids, mostly. But still, we've already covered this. When there is no tactical depth, there is no fun in a turn-based gameplay. And this shallowness of combat has not changed since Ultima 4. Sure. I would have preferred a good battle system for once, but with the lack thereof, the AI serves as a nice little painkiller that essentially minimizes this lacking aspect of the game, allowing you to spend more time with the things that are fun about it. Another absolute blessing is the ability to fight using a single character. In all Ultima games since 3, leveling up the characters evenly was always a pain. The XP goes to whoever delivered the finishing blow, so more often than not it results in jarring gaps between characters, inclining you to take matters in your own hands. Specifically, you had to surround foes so they wouldn't run away and then tediously skip turns of everyone except the underleveled character, who'd usually miss a lot because of that, adding to the tedium. In addition to being annoying, this process always seemed quite unsightly to me. It's like Remember that scene from Texas Chainsaw Massacre when they hold the girl down while the grandpa keeps missing her head with a hammer? Quest of the Avatar, ladies and gentlemen. So in 6 all you have to do is just not press the battle button, select the underleveled character in solo mode and go kill as many enemies as you want while the rest of your party simply stays in one place. Wonderful. If I had to pick the best thing about dungeons, it would be those occasional cool discoveries. NPCs in particular, like the expert thief Phoenix in Hiding, or the old pirate Yibara that seems to have a black hole for a stomach. Those encounters are fun. And that's the thing, isn't it? Ultima was never about dungeons. They invariably remain the worst part of any Ultima game we've covered so far. What's fun about those games is the overworld stuff. The towns, the quests, the dialogues, the puzzles, etc. There is a depth to those qualities that rivals that of Wizardry's dungeons. The town solving, the routing, the sense of non-linear progress through a web of interconnected quests that all serve towards the final resolution. So when Ultima 6 boasts a bigger amount of larger dungeons while lessening the amount of towns compared to 5, feels like the priorities were somewhat skewed here. What about the underworld? It must be right up your alley then. Oh yes, the underworld is a direct improvement over fives. It is not just an empty giant wasteland, but an island with a city in it, filled with interesting NPCs, quests, dialogues, and providing a glimpse into an entire different culture of gargoyles. It's perfect, it plays to the strengths of Ultima providing exactly what the player would want from a mysterious underworld. The music in 5 was better though. By the way, I should probably mention that the music is reused from the previous game, but here it just fits so much better. I would not recommend playing this game without music like I did the last time. I also appreciate that it is smaller than the overworld and that as soon as you enter it, you get a goal and directions from Baylem. 
Without a map and with such poor visibility, it would be a true nightmare to explore a giant location. The three dungeons in Underworld are interesting, by the way, all themed around different principles. The control dungeon has a lever puzzle that requires you to use your party members in a rather clever way. It's about control, both of the mechanisms you operate and the environment you occupy. The passion, I feel, could be a lot better. It's a straight line with a couple fire hazards that you can easily overcome with the mass protection spell. Not exactly the embodiment of a burning passion, I'd say. Imagine how cool it would be if this entire tunnel was filled with flames and lava. It would be at least visually novel and surprising. Diligence is especially peculiar. By hard and laborious work that requires diligence, the game assumes a big maze of repetitive rooms. It's like the game knows that those dungeons aren't all that fun. What is fun, though, is a philosophical analysis of a retro DOS game. I had worries going in that this game would not have any content worth dissecting, but I was pleasantly surprised. Thematically speaking, this game continues the deconstruction of the original quest from Ultima 4 that began in 5. Even though there is no grand crisis like in the latter, people have started to waver in their virtuousness. The humble Maginsians are innocent but humble. Scott O'Brien partakes far more in spirits than spirituality. In Jellum, people are afraid and defeated by a rat. Britain is more commercially driven than compassionate, and so on. The only place that truly lives up to its ideal is the Buccaneers Bay. Pirates and thieves are going about their business as usual. A suspicion might arise that Britannian values may not be as infallible as Lord British might want you to believe. At the very least, it's not the only functional morality system, which is highlighted with just how many interdimensional visitors you see in this game. Sigaleon is one such visitor coming from a dimension not dissimilar to Britannia, describing his arch-villain as a lot like your mundane. <laughs> Zog, on the other hand, is so different that to it, not just Britannian beliefs, but human perception of reality is wrong and bizarre. Even the Avatar himself comes from a world of, well, quite a variety of beliefs. Also notice how many characters in this game are mad. Sutek, the sewer guy, Hermit on an island, Yibara in shame, the grave digger and the mortician in you. The insane are perceived as such because they've stepped outside of the boundaries of normality. Not all of them are well adjusted. But their presence here highlights the line that was previously invisible. The line between the Britannian bubble and whatever is outside its norm. Most prominently, this line is illustrated with the central conflict that drives the plot. The war between humans and gargoyles. Gargoyles present an entirely different culture that functions just as well as Britannia. Their worldview is so different that the villains despised by humans, such as Mundane and Minox, are their saints. From Gargoyles' perspective, you are just as wrong as they are from yours. The false prophet follows not the principles of control, passion, and diligence. The conflict and hate between the races is a mere reflection of how different cultures see each other as monsters. These demons, however, are pale and soft. Even when they are trying to help each other, 
there is a cultural wall. When a cook offers, as a gesture of friendliness, some food, the peculiar taste of which is later noted by your party members, who discover to their great displeasure that they've dined on horse flesh. Or look at the healer who nearly kills Shamino several times before finally finding a potion that works. Because gargoyle anatomy is quite different to humans. In both of those situations you can bail out. And why shouldn't you? After all, Dupre wanted to stop you when you were offered an amulet wherein which served as an important step in establishing peace between races. And you can see where he's coming from, right? Dupre was afraid for you. Afraid that it would be a trick or a misunderstanding that would result in the death of his friend. Hell, if that healer was not as lucky and had actually killed Shamino, wouldn't someone like Dupre want to avenge his death on the unfortunate healer? You see how difficult it is to establish cross-cultural relations. An accidental loss of one life due to a misunderstanding can lead to a war that results in millions of casualties is not unprecedented in our own history. If you remain unconvinced of the difficulty, rest assured that so far we've covered easy examples. But now we come to the big one – slavery. Gargoyle society is segregated into the ruling, flying and the subservient, wingless classes. Which type the gargoyle becomes is determined at birth. The wingless are said to lack even the basic intelligence, operating more like animals. They can talk, for instance. Thus, they are used to work the plantations and wage combat. This sounds awfully awful, but let's give the benefit of the doubt. What if they are mentally underdeveloped? After all, we don't know gargoyle physiology, so we can't just blindly judge their society by our standards. We ourselves wouldn't have survived as a species without using animals as a workforce. Gargoyles live in an extremely harsh environment, so if, like the liberal Nash, they would give complete freedom to the wingless, they would not have enough food to maintain their society. They would die out. Considering with what respect and care they treat the wingless, it does seem plausible that this is all okay. Until you remember that the wingless Baylem, brought up by the somewhat isolated parent, seems perfectly capable of both speech and rational decision-making. And don't forget Sin Ral, who had to escape the underworld because he, despite having wings, is incapable of flight. So he was treated as a brainless animal by his peers. Only the greatest gargoyles receive names. So maybe Nash is the Martin Luther King of this society. The truth is, we simply don't know. Maybe Balaam is a mutant and Sinral a liar. Regardless, what we can say with certainty is that Britannian morality is now put into perspective. Ultima 4, if you recall, was reasserting the righteousness of Western values. 5 then showed how those values can be used to propagate harm. The point of Ultima 6 is to show that this moral code, or any code for that matter, is not infallible and definitely not the only one that works. During this game we see many people operating outside of Britannian value system that nevertheless lead good and productive lives. 
as well as entire gargoyle society that functions perfectly well while having the opposite of Britannian cultural code. And isn't it rather telling that the only thing which puts them on the verge of extinction is your actions. A western avatar on his messianic quest has journeyed to the dark underworld and brought back the Codex of Wisdom, leaving that underworld in total cultural disarray, demonizing its inhabitants as monsters when they retaliate in desperation. It would seem that they have reason to think you evil from their perspective. Who could have thought that Ultima 6 would be a proper example of post-colonial literature that deals with existential philosophy? It may not be as engaging as 4 or as atmospheric as 5, but I feel that it is in this game in particular that the classic computer RPG has been truly defined. And not just because of its leap in presentation. It combines the quest-driven non-linearity of 4 with the focus on world-building and atmosphere of 5 while introducing the numerous side quests and, most importantly, making the dialogues entertaining and character-driven. This truly feels like the last piece of the puzzle. What would Fallout, Planescape or Disco Elysium be without their fun characters and well-written dialogues. If there is one thing in which 6 stands taller than its predecessors, it's that. Almost every single one of those dozens upon dozens of NPCs has a unique personality, appearance and dialogues, each one of which is fun. Of course, when compared against the greatest titles in the genre, it will seem rather non-impressive. But, on its own merits, as a singular experience, I would say that Ultima 6 The False Prophet is a good game. Glad you liked that prostitute murdering utopia, as you call it. Oh, let's not get too hasty, Seal. To show you that I'm not discriminating, I do want to try that Armageddon spell before leaving. Let's see. Of course, who could have doubted that Lord British would survive the Armageddon?